Welcome to our lecture about internet security. Today, our last lecture, we want to speak about laws and ethics. The lecture, I already mentioned, has four parts. We start with discussing about risk analysis, computer crimes, and we had the most important chapter of this lecture where we discussed weaknesses and touches on the very different levels of interconnected IT systems. Then we discussed how to detect intrusions, how to detect attacks. And now, closing the lecture, we want to uh, discuss some issues concerning legal and ethical aspects in computer security. In the lecture, we have discussed the various security issues. And we have also discussed how it's possible to attack a system. Then, in the intrusion detection, uh, when we discussed intrusion detection systems, we asked the question how we can detect whether a system is attacked. In all cases, attacking, of course, is something that is forbidden. That, in uh, most cases, it is uh, forbidden for several reasons. And the question is how the traditional way in society to forbid things fits and is connected to the world of IT systems and issues. So we have discussed security issues resulting from weaknesses on all the different levels of interconnected IT systems. We have discussed human factors. We have discussed design errors in hardware, in software, in operating system, in network protocols, in applications, in interfaces, and others. And the question, if there are mistakes and errors, is it allowed to misuse this? Or is this forbidden? And when it is forbidden, why it is forbidden? And uh, this is what we want to discuss uh, today in the last lecture of our lecture series about internet security. How to forbid things, how things are forbidden in society. There are various ways of human of rules and of human controls. And the question is how this usual behavior, how these rules, how these human uh, controls fit or interact with the IT system. Of course, the goal is to prevent the misuse of IT system. And the more omnipotent the IT systems are, the more all our action in our life, in the, societal life, the social life, in the business life, are based on internet, on internet connected IT systems, the more relevant is the question how we can extend the human controls and rules also to this historical very new area. Typically, there are two ways in the society to control, to control things. That's not only concerned to IT, uh, IT issues, but also to all other areas. And of course, this also fit to internet security. On the one side, we have the legal system. The legal system with the rules, with the judges, with police, that, and with prison, uh, that people that do not follow, that uh, violate the rules, that they are punished, punished with fine or punished with, uh, with uh, prison. This is one system of control, of human control in society. The other system is a system of ethics. Because it's impossible to rule all our area, all our everyday life by means of rules, in human society, ethics, moral, play a big role and helps to organize <coughs> that humans can live together uh, without, uh, uh, without discussion and streets. So the legal system has adapted quite well to information and communication technology, to the ICT area. And the idea to adapt in this or to, uh, to apply rules in these new areas is that traditional forms of legal protection, like copyright, 
patents and others are also applied to the area of uh, IT systems to into the digital world. On some places, it was not possible. So legislative start to create new rules, new laws. It's a bit difficult and needs time because the technical development is much faster than the perception uh, by the justice system. But this is the one way uh, to control the uh, digital world and IT systems and IT security. With the ethics, nothing has to be changed if a new area becomes important in society. Because ethics and moral, uh, moral sentence are situational and are not so precise to say that they fit exactly to an IT system or fit to a car or fit to other things. They give us some principles how to behave well. So let's have a closer look uh, to these both systems and how they are, uh, what uh, both systems say about IT systems and IT world and digital world and how they are used to control the system. Let's start with some remarks about legal system. So law and computer security, they are related in several ways. Both affect privacy. Both affect security. These are big areas and, and uh, also in the physical world. And the same protection is needed also in the digital world. So with the rule, there are various uh, ideas, various uh, principles that are applied to uh, guarantee privacy, to guarantee secrecy, and these rules immediately also uh, can be used to control IT uh, digital world. As well, the law system, as well as computer security, both regulate the usage, the development, the ownership of personal assessed assets including data, including programs, including systems. And a third uh, a, a relation between law system and computer security is that both affects actions then can be taken to protect secrecy, to protect integrity, to protect availability of computer network system and services. But the law is a very traditional system. You know the parliament, they have to uh, design a rule, then there are big discussions about this. Then at the end, before these uh, princesses became rules, they need to be discussed in the parliament. So the design and the uh, uh, fixation of such laws and to bring laws into validity is a long way, needs time. All the parts of society are included. And this is often difficult with uh, bringing it uh, into congruence with the fast uh, development of IT systems. New computers provide new system. Internet is um, uh, the World Wide Web uh, is, about, uh, is about 25 years old. So it's very young and we up to now do not oversee all the consequences coming from uh, that digital world becomes more and more important. So law does no, uh, not always provide an adaptive control, neither in the computer and internet affairs nor in other domains. Here are some special problems. With respect, I mentioned this already, with respect to the computer methods, the law has evolved slowly. The digital world this is another uh, special problem. The digital world with computers and networks is something completely new in history. There is no uh, a idea, no understanding. There are new principles. We can exchange ideas all over the world within seconds, within milliseconds. We can uh, store mass of data. We are unable to delete data and others. So here, uh, there is no historical uh, uh, picture that one could follow when one designs rules for, that are valid for the digital world. 
And the third problem is that the judges, the lawyers, politicians, police officers, all that people that are, in, that are part of this legal systems often do not completely understand IT technology. They are no specialists. And when they do not understand the IT technology and the issues behind, then it's sometimes difficult uh, to determine what needs to be ruled, what is the right way to rule this, uh, and other uh, questions. Laws, and, uh, com uh, laws of computer and internet security affect very different groups of people. So they affect designers, they affect programmers, they affect maintainers of computer and network systems, maintainers of uh, databases. They affect administrators, technical administrators. They affect the executive officers in uh, the business world. They infect the normal user, uh, private people uh, around. So it is not only a special group that is affected by the uh, IT systems and by the laws uh, for the correct use of it. It is almost all the society that's involved. So law provide protection, but practically uh, they also uh, regulate, the laws also regulate the behavior of people that use computers and networks. The people know what's allowed, what's forbidden, and they follow this. So if in the street it's allowed to, uh, to uh, go with the speed of 50, then the people uh, go with the speed of 50. So also here, the laws in fact what people do and what people feel uh, is correct and is incorrect. So if the law system not adequately fits to the IT issues, then sometimes uh, uh, problems are caused. There are different fields. That's another problem and another aspect discussing about legal systems and IT security. There are different fields of protection of computer and network systems uh, by laws. On the one side, there is a protection of the computing systems, of the networks, the hardware, and the use of the computers against criminals. There is the protection not only of the hardware, but also of the software and of the data uh, that are uh, processed by uh, IT systems. There is a protection of how to access the IT systems, how to access the programs, how to use the programs, how to access services provided over the internet. And there are uh, protection of the privacy of the individuals. For example, in case of IT systems that support, uh, uh, that support medical uh, treatment in hospitals. So you see, it's a very a complex uh, uh, topic. And so I want to give a few ideas by discussing some examples. So we will discuss some examples, concrete examples, and some regulations by the German criminal law. In other countries, they have similar laws. So let's have a look to understand this uh, by uh, looking to a few examples. So the first example I want to discuss is spying out data. Spying out data, there is a paragraph in the Strafgesetzbuch, in the criminal code, in the German criminal code. And this is a paragraph 202a. And this 202a says the following. Getting data that are specially protected against unauthorized access that are stored electronically, magnetically, or in other form in which they are not directly perceptible without permission for oneself or for a third person. This will be punished by prison, prison sentence up to three years, or by a fine. So spying out data that are protected, 
that are specially protected, that are not uh, immediately perceptible, that are stored in an electronic form, without a permission for own use or for use of a third party, that's forbidden. There are under discussion some new rules, the paragraph 202b, which uh, regulates the unauthorized access, unauthorized access, or what we call hacking, hacking or what we have called hacking in the, in the lecture. This is forbidden even if nothing is done with the data. This is also a new idea that hacking, even if the data are not misused, that hacking to try to get technical, to get unauthorized access to resources, to data, that's forbidden. And there is another new rule concerning the creation and the publication of attack tools. Of attack tools, also this is punished. This is regulated in paragraph 202C of the criminal code, of the German criminal code. And it says this publication, the generation, the creation, uh, the, the publication of such attack tools is punished by law. And of course, here you see that sometimes very difficult and makes discussion about such, uh, such rules difficult because what we have seen in the lecture, the tools are not per se attack tools or not attack tools. Many of these tools can be used by the administrator of, a, of an IT system, of a network, to check whether the network works correctly. For example, sniffer. So to control in a permiscuous code all traffic in a network is a tool that the administrator used to guarantee the functionality of the network. If the tool comes into the hand of an attacker, then he or she can misuse and can uh, use the tool to spy out data. So here one has to be very careful and it's uh, tricky to decide whether the tool is for supporting the functionality of an, of an IT system or whether the tool is uh, used as an attacking tool. Let's, uh, look, let's have a look to another example. Computer fraud, betrug. This is regulated in paragraph 263A in the German criminal code. And this, uh, this uh, paragraph weighs the following. Influencing the result of data processing with the purpose of gaining properties illegally for oneself or for a third party, for another person, that will be punished by a prison sentence up to five years or by a fine. Also, this is forbidden to uh, influence data processing systems with a purpose to uh, gain uh, illegally, uh, properties illegally. A third example, data modification. This is the example that should help you to get a feeling what can be done with rules and what kind of rules are in place uh, already. So let's have a look to the data modification. And there is an another paragraph in the German criminal code. That's the paragraph 303A. And this paragraph says the following. Illegal manipulation of data by deletion, by suppressing, by modification, by making them unusable, that will be punished by a prison sentence up to five years or by fine. There are small cases without big consequences in data modification, data manipulation, but there are also on the other side data manipulation that can influence human lives. For example, in medical systems or uh, catastrophic uh, catastrophe, um, uh, security systems and others. Here it is important that already the attempt 
to manipulate data, to modify data, is punishable. So they try to influence all this. This is forbidden, and uh, there is an, a punish. Also here, with respect to data modification, there is a new rule, a discussion about, uh, uh, about uh, making it more precise and learning from experience to, to make the rules better fitting to uh, the everyday uh, problems. New rule uh, considers the preparation of a break-in. For, for example, scanning uh, uh, a network uh, or uh, systems is forbidden. One more example, computer sabotage. Here is a paragraph 303b of the criminal code uh, uh, gives, some, uh, gives some rule. And the rule says that disturbing data processing of another company or of a public authorization which is of significant importance by an offense uh, according to 303A, this was a data manipulation uh, paragraph, by destroying, damaging, making unusable, removing or modifying a data processing system or data storage, a system will be punishable by a prison sentence up to five years or by a fine. Here, also, one has to see that already the attempt to uh, perform a computer sabotage is punishable. There are under discussion some changes, some tighten the laws, and this is no, no, uh, no wonder, nobody need to wonder about this, because system, we all get more and more experience about the field of how IT systems that are interconnected by internet can be misused, what are the typical attacks. And so with the rules, one tries to find an exact description of what is forbidden and uh, to fix these uh, in laws. So it needs time, I mentioned this already. So in the moment, the discussion is around the following topics. The ownership, the, ownership, the installation, the maintenance of tools that allow the unauthorized access to access controlled services that are used commercially, that is going to forbidden. So the ownership, the installation, the maintaining of hacker tools in order to get unauthorized access to access controlled IT systems and services which are commercially used is going to forbidden. And the primary purpose here in this field is that the protection of commercial internet services and pay TV. This is what uh, the people try to uh, uh, protect by inventing such new uh, rules. Whether this rule will uh, also apply password cracker and security scanners and such tools has not yet been decided. So it's an ongoing discussion, ongoing society discussion. The goal is to hopefully get a very precise description of what should be uh, uh, forbidden and what uh, uh, should not be forbidden. Uh, if we discuss, for example, the example of a password cracker, we use it, for example, here in the security research and, uh, and projects to, uh, to uh, increase the awareness of people to select uh, secure passwords. And yesterday was a day of the safe internet, and of course, passwords and the discussion of password security is a very important uh, mean to increase the security of computer system when passwords are correctly uh, and safely selected. 
This were some examples. Now let's consider case studies. Case studies and let's see and understand how these laws we have discussed and, and seen in the example can be uh, used uh, in such cases uh, to uh, decide what's allowed, what's forbidden. The first case study is uh, sniffing a wireless LAN. And the scenario we want to consider is the following. Uh, many, you know this by yourself, many wireless LANs are insecure. So it is very simple for hacker to sniff uh, is it all the data tracking. What are the reasons? There are several reasons. One reason is, we discussed this in former lecture, is that the encryption technique that comes by standard with a wireless LAN, the web protocol, is known to be weak. It's known to be weak. Uh, it was published several times, and we discussed these weaknesses in a former lecture. The paragraph 202A about criminal code spying our data, we discussed this before, is restricted to specially protected data. Now the question is, is it allowed to, uh, is it allowed to sniff data in a wireless LAN with the argument the encryption is weak or there is not at all uh, encryption in place? So the paragraph 2.2a of the criminal code, the paragraph ruling spying out data cannot be applied because there is no special protection. And the paragraph insists that spying out data that are specially protected. So question here, what is the uh, situation? But there is another paragraph. We also have uh, discussed this was uh, 2.2b, which forbids sniffing, sniffing of any data, not only of the data that are specially protected. So 2.2b forbids sniffing of any data that's not supposed to be uh, read by a third person. So these are private data. So we see sniffing a wireless LAN even if the traffic is unencrypted or only weakly encrypted, is illegal. But on the other side, you see how difficult and how precise uh, the rules are formulated, need to be formulated, and how different prospects one can uh, take to try to assess a situation, a special situation. Let's consider another uh, case study, the importance of log information. Let's uh, consider the scenario that the user's IT system is attacked over the internet. The user finds out the attacker's IP address. You remember, it's not easy, and often it's not the attacker's IP address, often it's the IP address of a bot client of a botnet. So typically a person, a computer, that does not even know that he was misused as an attack tool. So user detects and retrieves um, such an uh, IP address. Then he, it's easy to find out what is the corresponding ISP, the corresponding internet the service provider. Uh, one has to, uh, one has to uh, consider this RIPE database. And then one finds out from which uh, internet service provider, uh, which internet service provider has, is responsible for that IP address. And then, and that's the correct way, the user sends an email, a notification, not necessarily email, could also be a telephone call or whatever, sends a notification to the administrator of the ESP. So the user of an attacked uh, system informs the ISP of the attacker. And from now on, as soon as the administrator receives that a notification, the administrator is obliged to save, obliged 
to deserve all available log files that contain data about the potential hacker. This is important to later find out is this, was it the attacker or was the station that was misused and then to uh, take countermeasures. So as soon as an administrator of an ISP is informed that one system uh, in his area was misused as an attack station, he has to store all relevant log information. And any deletion of this information after that not notification is punishable. So he has to do. He has to do, and if later on uh, the, uh, the log files are deleted or manipulated in a sense, the attack, the, the administrator of the ISP is responsible because that's forbidden. Let's have a look to a next case study. A case study which deals with the question, what is, uh, uh, how is the situation when publishing a hacker tool? The current situation concerning publishing of hacker tools is the following. Tools are freely available in the internet. So you can find uh, URLs where you can download hacker tools. Some companies ship CDs, DVDs, with comprehensive collections of hacker tools. They do this under the argument that they give the administrator some means, some tools in hand. He can check whether his uh, network is correctly configured. What we know about this situation? There is a general rule. A general rule says a vendor is not responsible for improper application of a product. You know this from physical life. Uh, you cannot uh, make the producer of a fork or knife uh, make responsible that criminals use forks and uh, knives to attack other people. So the rule says a vendor is not responsible for the improper application of a uh, product. But the vendor is considered guilty, is considered guilty of adding a crime, of adding a crime, if it is likely that the tool is used for a criminal action. Likely that the tool is used, is misused uh, for a criminal action. So you see there are two principles that are in contradiction. And concerning the concrete situation, it needs to be decided, and for, that, uh, for such decision we have judges, it needs to be decided what rule has to be applied. So the way a tool is offered and described may have an influence, whether it's considered as a criminal tool, a criminal tool, and the vendor is considered to be aiding a, a, a crime, or whether the uh, tool is considered as an administrator tool to find out weaknesses of the uh, network. So the way a tool is offered and described may have an influence on whether the crime is considered likely or not. In any case, the vendor cannot reject, cannot reject liability by warning, by merely warning against the abuse of the hacker tool. So it's not enough to provide the tool and say, be careful, it can be misused. The way a tool is offered, this is uh, very important. On the other side, there is a principle that a tool provider can only be punished if a crime has taken place. Merely the possibility of a crime is not punishable. So you see, it's complicated. One has to uh, have an, a close look. And also, when we in education, in, in, in the seminar or in our research, use 
such tools to find out weaknesses of systems, we every time need to exactly consider what is the boundary that given by rules that are described by rules which says what is, what is forbidden. So the above mentioned applies also to other tools that are distributed for free in internet. So not only for the tools that are uh, immediately uh, uh, recognizable as hacker tools, but also some other tools uh, can be misused uh, for crimes. Let's have a look to another case study. A case study also with our research group. We uh, sometimes got such uh, tasks and such projects from banks or from companies. The question was, they came and say, you are a specialist in security, please check our systems. Check whether there is a weakness. We trust you and uh, we uh, understand that you know how attackers try to attack a system. So do this in order to find out whether there is some weaknesses and give us some hints to improve security. So security tests may cause and are an important tool uh, uh, to find out the, uh, the, the, the correct configuration of a network and the correct work of the systems, but it causes many kinds of breaches and problems. Because if one performs such a security test to find out whether the access control system works correctly and the system works not correctly, then the people that test this get access to sensitive data. If in the security testing a denial of service attack is uh, performed in order to find out whether the systems are stable enough also uh, uh, when hacker try to perform denial of service attack, also this is a question. The activation of security personnel due to the intrusion detection. Sometimes with the security tests, the company will also get checked whether the person, the IT personnel, works correctly, is qualified enough, has, uh, has a knowledge that's needed. For that reason, before such security tests uh, are performed, the customer must sign a disclaimer. There need to be a contract which exactly says what is the task of the security tests, what is the danger, what is the boundary that need to be accepted by the people that perform this uh, security test. It needs to be exactly listed, explicitly listed, which IP addresses are tested. Nevertheless, there are a couple of critical issues. The testing of IT addresses, of course, is difficult if the addresses are dynamically uh, assigned. You know, uh, with this net mechanism, it is possible that all the employees of a company use a few external work altogether with only a few external, uh, uh, ex external IP addresses. So if one tests something and this IT address is dynamically changed, it's a problem. It's a problem and contradicts with this point which says if you perform a security test, you have to exactly list the IP addresses that are tested. Another point is that the IP addresses are provided by the internet service provider not by the company, and if one test IP address in discussion with the company, then also the ESP, the internet service provider, is affected. So you see, it's a very interesting area. There are not only technical aspects that we have discussed uh, in all the former lectures, but there are also legal very interesting legal aspects. I will close the remarks to the legal system with a few remarks about the responsibility of IT managers. 
after your study, you become IT managers. So what is your responsibility in company and with respect to IT security? And it's exactly ruled. It says IT managers are obliged to take precautions to, uh, to avert damages from their companies, from their institutions, and from third parties. So this is ruled in the German civil law. Man IT managers are obliged to offer information on IT security to the business management. If you are responsible for a computer center and there you detect an attack, then it's not allowed to to, then this uh, information has to provide it also to the business management. This is a problem sometimes because some of the IT person are not quite sure whether the attack is a result of unprofessional security measures or whether the success of the attack comes from some human factor or other things. So it's not, a good, uh, it's not a good message to give it to the uh, business management, but the business management need to know if something happens with the IT system. So in case of a crime, for example, uh, it's the misuse of computer data, the break-in or stealing of data, an IT manager may be punished as a representative of the company, even if the crime was committed by external hacker. So they will check whether there was some mistake on side of the IT manager's responsibility, inside the, uh, the, the department of the IT manager's responsibility, and whether this mistake was a reason for the damage that uh, were caused, for example, by stealing all uh, uh, credit card numbers and names. Today in the news, there was a new, uh, new very, big, uh, very big scandal uh, concerning this. Here, of course, one has to see and to distinct between a negligent behavior, perhaps by human failure, and an intentional behavior uh, by the responsible persons. This, only, this were only a few remarks to the legal system inside. Now let's have a look to the ethical system and discuss some ethical issues concerning IT security, computer security, internet security. The reason why a society ne needs ethics and moral is that it's impossible. That's completely impossible to develop laws that describe all and enforce all forms of behavior that is unacceptable for society or acceptable. There are the things that can be ruled, needs to be ruled, but there are many places, many situations where uh, the, uh, another system, another human control system is needed and in society we have very good experience with such uh, weaker principle and situation with ethics and moral. So instead uh, our society relies on ethics and morals to prescribe generally accepted standards for proper behavior. What is right, what is bad, what one should do, what one should not do. This is in a fuzzy way described by the rules of ethics and morals. And you know some people accept this to a larger extent than others. And if people do not accept or do not follow these rules of ethics and morals, Sometimes the law system cannot do something against, but it is not good for the, uh, for the community. So ethics standards are often follow often idealistic principles. 
since they focus on one objective. In a concrete situation, often several moral objectives may be involved. So that the people have to find out, have to determine whether uh, what uh, is the appropriate action considered to all the objectives. And each person in each situa situation has to find out what is a way for an acceptable behavior. And to find out this, what is unacceptable, what's acceptable, these ethic and moral rules are helping the people. But different people in the same situation can come to different decisions. Even though religious groups, as well as or, uh, professional organizations, promote certain standards and ethical behavior, ultimately each person is responsible to design what to do. There are several problems with ethics. The first is ethical principles are not universal. In the different cultures, there are different behaviors considered acceptable or inacceptable. There are some very human general rules that are accepted in almost all cultures. But in more concrete situation, we can consider different behavior. So the ethical values vary by society, vary in history, vary from person to person, uh, uh, even within a society. Here are some examples. Here in uh, Europe, particular West Europe, particular German, the concept of privacy is considered very important. It is a basic principle in the Western culture. But it's considered not so important if you have a look to Eastern cultures. There is a standard of privacy, the accepted standard, what the people think is allowed, what's not allowed, is a different standard than uh, in our society. Ethics does not provide exact answers. Ethics provide principle, provide ideas, and the human has to find out in a concrete situation, for to the concrete situation there are uh, different principles that can be applied, and the human has to find out what principle he is following. So there is an ethical pluralism. And this pluralism is recognizing that typically more than one position may be ethically justifiable in a given situation. There is not only one behavior that's acceptable. There are different behaviors which are acceptable, and there are more that are not acceptable. Let's uh, try to compare the law system and what can be ruled by laws with the system of ethics. In the law, the laws are described by formal written documents. Oh, yes. This is this smart board not working correctly. The law is described by formal written documents. Everyone can look for each letter. And you know, in a curve, sometimes there is a discussion about the precise discussion, like mathematics. In the, the uh, now it's all wrong here. It's a pity it works, but with each new update, new failure come with the smartboard software. Let's um, make a new try. So we compare law. Uh, so the law is described by formal written documents. The law is interpreted, the rules are interpreted by courts. The established, the law is brought into rule by a legislature by a parliament that represents all people. The law 
is valid and applicable for everyone. The law, the law, in the law system, the priority of the laws, of different laws that affect the situation, is determined by courts in case of this applicable laws conflicting, are conflicting. The court is the final arbiter of what is right. And the, uh, the uh, law enforcement is enforced by police and courts. Let's have a look to the ethics system. Here, ethics are described by unwritten principles. Each person has to individually interpret the different principles and has to make personal decisions. The ethics system is presented by philosophers, philosophers, by religions, by professional groups. It is a personal choice. And the priority, if different principles may be applicable in a situation, the priority is determined by an individual if two principles conflict. There is no external arbiter and only a limited enforcement. So you see there are, on all the levels, big differences between the formal law system and the informal uh, uh, system of ethics. Also, let's now consider a few case studies. Case studies that show how uh, uh, different ethical principles may affect the situation and what kind of thinking is necessary to make the right decision, uh, the right decision uh, uh, for an individual. That's the first case study, uh, the first situation we want to consider is uh, assume a person is working as a programmer in a software company or another company. There are several principle, ethical principles involved when he is uh, doing his work and when he makes decisions uh, and when he, uh, how to find out how he uh, uh, behaves in the correct way. There is a principle of the ownership of the resources. Who is the owner of the computers uh, to which the system are developed? Who is the owner of the programs? Uh, who is the owner of the ideas and others? Another principle that comes in is how the work of this programmer affects others, affects colleagues in the team, in the programmer team, affects the company as a whole, affects the person that use the product uh, which is uh, programmed by the programmer, uh, could it be misused, could it be used to create damage in others? There are some universalism principles involved. All the actions that can be done with the result of the work should be acceptable also for others. There are possibility of detection, what in case of failure, what in case of bad work, what in case of intentional bad work, what about punishments. So you see, these are different principles, and it's not formally exactly written as a rule that affect to gate the programmer to behave in a correct way. Let's have a look to a, a situation where privacy rights play an important role. And let's have a look to an employee in a health department which has access to digital patient records. There are various ethical principles involved. 
For example, this patient records may contain information that there is a death that leads to, that there is an illness that leads to the death of the person. This affects very, very uh, immediately the person himself, but also the family and other people. So ethical principles that are, of course, there is a responsibility for the job, for the company I work. This is some general responsibility. Here in this case, there is a particular responsibility in the U in, because there is access to very secure data, to very private data, the health data of the patient. There is a lot of scenarios the data can be misused. So there is a responsibility to uh, uh, not to provide the possibility for a misuse or to misuse data by itself. So for example, a lousily configuration of the system so that from outside data can be accessed is a, a possible misuse. But also taking data and telling about the, uh, the knowledge received from the data to unauthorized persons. The confidentiality principles, tacit permission, the proprietary, proprietary uh, principles. So all this affects each concrete situation of a person working in a health, uh, in a health department and having access to very private, private uh, digital patient records. Let's look to another case study interesting for programmers in a company. The question, who owns a program? So let's, uh, let's consider this is a case that a programmer has designed the program for his company and now he thinks, oh, that's a good idea as a program. I designed it, so it belongs to me, so I can sell it privately or uh, uh, give it to friends and others. Also, in this situation, there are several ethical principles involved. What is about intellectual property? Of course, if the uh, designer, if the programmer has designed the program, uh, he has... Uh, uh, he has a right to this intellectual property. But he does not own this program because he gets money. So it was his job to design this program. So it's a very tricky thing. So if uh, doing his work he finds some news which is patent, then there is a rule that he needs uh, uh, that he needs to be uh, a part and that he has the right to get something from the uh, from the profit that comes out of this uh, invention but the right is with the company uh, he works for and he's paid for so these questions are what is with a priority in this discussion so you see it is Difficult to analyze such situation. There is a rule in Germany, Arbeitnehmer Erfindungsgesetz, which exactly rules what is the amount a person uh, that was involved in, uh, uh, in finding some, uh, uh, some news, some invention that may be patented, uh, and uh, what belongs to the company, what belongs to the person. If the company are, company are not interested, they can hand over it to the person. Uh, so there is an interesting case, uh, sometimes also, uh, which plays sometimes also a role in our research work. Let's finish our lecture with some remarks about how these ethical principles are described. And there are various codes of ethics. So I will not discuss about religious or society rules. 
I will discuss and show you and in, 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 uh, introduce to you some code of ethics that comes from IT groups. IT groups that have sought to develop such code of ethics for their members. So uh, as an advisory for the people, particularly for IT person, uh, most computer organizations have designed such code of ethics. So the biggest computer organization is IEEE. You remember we discussed several standards that are designed by this uh, organization. This is the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. So also the IT persons are part of this a group of electronics engineers. Uh, engineers. We have the uh, world biggest society of IT specialists, that's the ACM, the Association of Computing Machinery. We have in Germany the Gesellschaft für Informatik, GI, GI. Also, this is a professional organization uh, for uh, IT specialists and invites students uh, to become member without member fee. Uh, so they all prescribe such codes of ethics to their members. And this code of ethics is adapted exactly to the situation of persons that are IT specialists that work in programming or in company or are responsible for this. So uh, let's have a closer look to such code of ethics. Let's start with the code of ethics of the IEEE organization. And in their code of ethics, they say, they formulate, we, the members of IEEE, in recognition of the importance of our technologies in affecting the quality of life throughout the world, and in accepting a personal obligation to our profession, its members, and its communities, we serve to hereby commit ourselves to conduct of the highest ethical and professional manner, and we agree. And now there are typically 10 rules. It's clear the 10, number 10, comes from the 10 uh, uh, rules of the Bible. So the first rule in the uh, code of ethics of IEEE is we agree to accept responsibility in making engineering decisions consistent with the safety, the health, and the welfare of the public and to disclose promptly factors that may endanger the public or the environment. We agree to avoid real or perceived conflicts of interest whenever possible and to disclose them to affect parties when they do exist. We, the members of IEEE, agree to be honest and realistic in stating claims or estimates based on available data. So engineers in code of ethics are agree are forced to say honest and realistic about projects they are involved. For example, think to the airport disaster. The members of IEEE code of ethics agree to reject bribery in all its forms. We agree to improve understanding and technology of technology, its appropriate application, and potential consequences. We agree to maintain and improve our technical competence and to undertake technological tasks for others only if qualified by training or experience or after full disclosure of pertinent uh, limitations. We agree to seek, accept, and offer honest criticism of technical work, to acknowledge and correct errors, and to credit properly the contributions of others. 
We agree to treat fairly all persons regardless of such factors as race, religion, gender, disability, age, or national origin. We agree to avoid injuring others, their property, their reputation, or employment by false or malicious actions. And the final principle, we, the members of IEEE code, agree to assist colleagues and co-workers in their professional development and to support them in following this code of ethics. So this is, this are, these are the principles formulated in the code of ethics of the biggest uh, uh, organization of uh, engineers, electrical and electronic engineers and IT specialists in the world, IEEE. There are other code of ethics, and particularly for the field uh, of IT security, I will mention the code of ethics of the Computer Institute, of the Computer Ethics Institute uh, in Washington. They formulated, they concentrated on this question and they formulated 10 uh, principles, also 10 principles, uh, which uh, uh, looks as follows. First principle, thou should not use a computer to harm other people. Thou should not interfere with other people's computer work. Thou should not snoop around in other people's computer files. Thou should not use a computer to steal, steal data or other things. Thou should not use a computer to be a false witness. Here are the mobbing uh, uh, sites in the internet. Thou should not copy or use proprietary software for which you have not paid. And that's not only software, that's also true for uh, multimedia data. Thou should not use other people's computer resources without authorization or proper compensation. Thou should not appropriate other people's intellectual output. Thou shouldn't think about the social consequences of the program you are writing or the system you are designing. This is responsible for our, uh, for our work. That we have to think that with our, the result of our works, our programs, our systems, we should every time think about what are the consequences of using this and are there consequences, are there danger, uh, potential of dangers when misusing product of our work. And the last, the tenth principle of the code of Computer Ethics Institute says they should always use a computer in ways that ensure consideration and respect for fellow humans. So this is much more comprised, much more directed to the work of IT professionals. And it concludes our lecture where we discussed about the technical ways uh, and the technical problems, the weaknesses and the vulnerabilities of uh, internet-based IT systems. And doing work in this field, it's important that there are specialists needed we every time should also think about consequences uh, and the ethical principles in our work. Thank you for your attention.